And now we will move to the upper limb trauma session. And our first speaker will be Professor Yasser Safuri, Professor of Orthopedic Surgery and one of the eminent stars of upper limb surgery in Egypt, and also the head of uh, uh, Kasri Laini uh, Cairo uh, Orthopedic Department. Professor Yasser will speak about management of acromic clavicular dislocation. Professor Yasser, please. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Mohammed Al Ashab, for inviting me for this uh, webinar. Uh, uh, is my screen? Do uh, you see my screen properly? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. We see it, sir. Oh, thank you very much. So uh, I'll be talking about the acromic clavicular joint dislocation, its classification, and how we can manage uh, this problem. As Dr. Ashab said. I'm uh, the chairman of the orthopedic department, Kastelein Hospital Kain University. I will be talking about our experience in treating these types of uh, injuries. These injuries occur as a result of direct trauma falling on the shoulder with this pressure on the acromion and then dislocation of the AC joint. So there's a ligament, ligament injury. As long as there is trauma and high injury trauma, then there is yeah. ligament injury. Yeah. These ligament injuries uh, are the AC joint with its ligaments, the CC joint, which stabilizes the clavicle to the coracoid. These are common injuries, 9% of the shoulder girdle injuries. It's more common in males than uh, males and more common in athletes. As I said, it can happen as a result of falling on the shoulder or even direct trauma to the shoulder. Okay, so there are two main ligaments which are very important for stability. These are the AC ligaments and the CC ligaments, a chromoclavicular ligament and the coracoclavicular ligaments. You should know there is some motion in the joint. This joint has some motion as gliding and rotation, and this is very important in doing the overhead elevation. There are certain factors for stability, which may be static or dynamic. Static, it's the capsule of the AC joint with its ligaments, mainly the superior and the posterior part of the capsule, which is thickened. And this type of ligaments are important for the horizontal stability. But the other ligaments, which are the CC ligament, coracoclavicular ligament, which is important for the vertical stability. The dynamic forces are two big muscles. These are the deltoid and the trapezius muscle. Okay, these ligaments have certain anatomy and have a footprint. You should be oriented by the anatomy and should know how to repair these ligaments. So as I said, the CC ligament is the conoid and the trapezoid and they have a certain footprint. The AC joint and this capsule is thickened by ligaments, especially the superior and the posterior part, and it's very important for the stability in the horizontal direction. We treat these fractures or dislocations by certain classification, one known, which is the rock classification. Type one is only sprain of the AC ligament. Type two, rupture of the AC ligament, but stable. Type three, which is divided into two parts, it's entry of the AC and the CC ligament but A and B are two different types, which I will mention in the coming few slides. Type four is posterior displacement of the clavicle. Type five is complete rupture and instability of the AC joint. Type six, which is rare, is the subcoracoid dislocation of the clavicle. Very simply, we use X-rays. One of these X-rays is well known as the Zanaka view, in which there is it's an EP view with the beam directed at about 15, 20 degrees. This gives you a clear picture of the AC joint. Also, we can compare both sides and we measure the distance between the coracoid and the clavicle. Some authors, I don't prefer this, can use weight to differentiate if there is instability of one side more than the other. Another view which is very important is the Alexander view. It's an outlet view with cross maneuver of the arm, and you compare both sides. As you see here, there is subluxation of the 
join. We do not, in all cases, use CT scans, 3D CT scans, or MRI, especially only in special types of injuries. And if you want to have other idea about the ligaments, in some cases, especially in the late cases. As I said, type three is divided into two parts, A and B. A, it's a stable joint. B, there is posterior displacement of the cavity. So there is horizontal instability. It's very important to diagnose these injuries and we call it DPT, dynamic posterior translation. If it's missed and you treat these patient conservatively, they will have pain, especially in athletes. As you see here, it's very clear if you take a proper X-ray that the clavicle is displaced posterior. Although in the AP view, you can find it not displaced and it's type three. These, these injuries, if they are not treated well, then they will have this kinesia and have pain in the shoulder. Therefore, the treatment is mainly conservative and surgical. Conservative by a single sling and then early rehabilitation. Surgical, we should go with the classification of Rockwood as I mentioned before. So if you put an algorithm for treatment, we can say that type one and two, we treat conservatively. Type four to six, it's operative. But type three, you should differentiate between A and B. But in hard workers, manual workers and athletes, we treat type three surgically. If he is not an athlete, we should differentiate between A and B. If it's B, then it's surgical. In all these cases, we follow up the patient. Sometimes after treatment, conservative treatment, they still have pain. These patients, we can reconstruct the procedures. There's moderate evidence to support that early treatment is better than late treatment. But there are certain few articles which mention that we can interfere early for better results. In our school, in Kassarani, we treat them early. So I, as I mentioned, type B, which is the posterior displacement, if it's left, it will lead to scapular dyskinesia, which means bad position or abnormal of the scapula while doing overhead elevation. Also known as the six scapular syndrome. It's very, very uh, troublesome for the sports and the athletes, and they have fatigue, and it's very difficult to treat. You should early diagnose these types of edges. Surgical management is all about healing of the CC ligament and the EC ligament. And we can use different types of treatment, either using metal devices to keep the joint in its place or suspension devices. We prefer in our hospital to use metal devices. We use the hook plate. But there are other types like with different names, like using a screw between the clavicle and the coracoid. Suspension devices, we can do it also arthroscopically as minimally evasive procedure. It has its advantages and disadvantages. But you should know, as I, read, as I mentioned before, that it's very important to reduce both joints reduce the distance between the crocodile and clavicle and reduce the AC joint in both planes. Historically, they only used to attack only the coracoacrimic limit, neglecting the AC uh, joint. But this proved by time that it's not right and it's very better to do it properly and reduce the AC joint with the coracoacrimic ligament. Otherwise, you will have this type of pain which is called the DPT, sick scapula syndrome. Okay, the hook plate. We use the hook plate most of our cases. It has advantages, perfect reduction, early mobilization. After one week, you can go back to work. No residual form body remains in the patient because it is removed the plate after four months. The disadvantage, you need to remove the plate after four months and also it does not address the co-pathology intra-articular, which is present in 20% of patients above 45 years old. But you should know there are different types of hook plates. 
or different heights. You should use the proper plate. Otherwise, you will have over reduction and the patient will have pain and he will not be able to do early mobilization. Suspension device arthroscopically has a lot of advantages like minimally invasive, and you can address the intraarticular pathology. As I mentioned before, it's present 20% of patients above 45 years old. The disadvantages restrict post-operative protocol, and you may lose some of the reduction during the follow-up. Sometimes they use buttons, so there is irritation of this foreign body, which is not removed. And there's also an instance of 20% of iatrogenic fracture of the cavity. I will show you my experience in 15 years of treating these patients with the hook plate. So this is the case, as you see here, with this location of the AC joint. The hook plate is used to reduce the clavicle in both planes. And then you repair the ligaments. This is an operative photo showing the stay sutures in the ligaments, coracoclavicular ligament, showing the hook, not inside the joint, but outside the joint behind it, with proper reduction of the AC joint in both planes and repairing the ligament. Then you close the soft tissue above the hook plate. This is another case in which you use the hook plate. This is another type of hook plate with more length, and you are sure that there's no overcorrection of the cavity. This is the early follow-up, one week, 10 days after removing the sutures, then he can move his forearm, his arm, and he do some jogging, especially if he's an athlete. Then after four months, you just remove the plate, very simple procedure, just remove it and slip it out, and it will not interfere with his return to sports, maybe after three or four days only because of the wound. Sometimes there's comminution in interarticular fractures. The hook plate is very suitable for these types of injuries, in which you can reduce and fix the uh, bone fragments with early rehabilitation and early movements of the shoulder. Sometimes, a case like this, you have dislocation or posterior displacement of the cap with complete rupture of the coracoclavicular ligament. This is a very difficult case to treat. As you see here, in these cases, you use also the hook plate with the repair of the ligaments, with early rehabilitation. To conclude, we can reach the best results by early management within three weeks, proper selection of the type of the hook plate, reducing in two planes, repair of the EC ligament at the CC ligament, early rehabilitation, and removal of the hardware in four months. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Professor Yasser Safuri, Professor of Orthopedic Surgery and the head of the Department of Orthopedic Surgery, Cairo University, and one of the eminent stars of upper limb surgery in Egypt and all over the world. Thank you so much, sir, for being with us. Thank you very much. Dr. Thank you for sharing your very long experience with us, sir. Thank you very much. Uh, may I ask again our dear professors to uh, answer the questions in the uh, question answer box down there, because we are out of time for the international speakers. If uh, you can please uh, write the answers to our dear attendees, uh, I will be very grateful. Thank you so much. Uh, now we will move to the next speaker. Our uh, next speaker will be uh, Professor Asam El Karif. Professor of Orthopedic Surgery, Alexandria University. Professor Asam, I call the Ilm and Akhlaq in Alexandria and in Egypt. All of you, thank you very much, Mr. Fandam, for your time. Professor Asam will speak about choice of implants for complex distoradius fractures, a very important topic. Thank you so much, sir. Professor Assam, you are with us, sir? Uh, yes. Uh, yes. Uh, yes. Uh, yes. Uh, yes. Uh, yes. Uh, 
Professor Asam, Harak Mayan Efendim. Oh, uh, yes, just one second. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I'm sorry, sir. Full screen. Sitting. Okay. Yes, sir. We can see your presentation, sir. Okay, I'll we'll just start. Full screen, please, sir. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you very much, uh, uh, dear Sherman, uh, Professor Ashab. This is a great honor to be with you in this uh, marvelous uh, uh, seminar or webinar. I'll speak today about the choice of the implants in complex distal radial fractures. At the distal end radius fractures is the matter of interest of all of the orthopedic surgeons and uh, it is an everyday practice of all of us. And the concepts and the principles of management for treatment of these cases has been totally changed in the last decade. Now each fracture should have its tailored and designed way of management. Uh, we have, for example, uh, such complex fracture. We have to study the fracture displacement, the joint involved, whether it is the radiocarpal or the uh, distal radio ulnar joint also is involved. And we have to assume the mechanism of injury we have to identify the size of the fragments and its location. We have to comment about the bone quality. If there is any associated soft tissue injury or ligamentous injury, uh, either intrinsic or extrinsic ligaments. And also we have to consider the patient requirements and his age. So we need to know a detailed anatomy and the biomechanics for each fracture in order to uh, choose the most appropriate way of management of these injuries. We also may need to use different modalities for uh, treatment in the same time. And of course, none of us would like to reach this stage of complications with malunion, erosions, um, disruption of the articular cartilage, uh, disruption of the DRUJ, uh, ulnar impaction, TFCC tear, and persistently painful wrist, and we can function. So all of these points we have to address while assessing the fracture of the distal end of the radius, the fracture displacement, mechanism of injury, what are the joints in, in involved, location and size of the fragments, stability of the fracture, bone quality, if there is any associated soft tissue or not, and the age and requirements of the patient. Most of the uh, treatment options for the uh, fracture of the distal end of the radius, either distraction way or buttressing way, with the use of external fixator or internal fixator with or without Kirchner wires or buttressing blades or fragment specific fixation. We have several types of plates present in the market with low profile, thick plates, uh, locked plates, variable angles, fixed angles, and so on. If we take this uh, um, fracture, for example, we have comminuted fracture, maybe die punch, compression injury, shortening of the distal end of the radius, particularly on the right side, radial height may be disturbed and a fragment uh, affecting the articular cartilage and the fragment is embedded inside with dorsal displacement. And we have to reconstruct all of this and restore the normal anatomy and the normal heights and angulations of the distal end of the radius. Studying of the uh, CT scan, comminution, particularly on the ulnar side. But we can note that the radial side or the radial cortex is intact. Only the radial, the ulnar side is affected. 
as we can see here. But in this uh, um, uh, sections, we can see that the volar cortex also is entered. And the comminution is present only on the dorsal side, while the volar side is entered. So we have to approach this fracture through the dorsal side, not the volar side. So we went from the dorsal approach and using a buttress plate and transosseous suturing. This is another example of complex distal radial end uh, radius fractures with very comminuted, small, very small fragments, massive shortening, complete translocation of the hand and carpal bones. Now, how can we reduce these fragments? How can we fix? How can we restore the normal anatomy and the length of the distal end of the radius? Are we gonna do some sort of distraction or compression or buttressing to reach a construct stable enough and to be maintained till the union? We prefer to use the internal fixation or internal uh, uh, distraction plates or distraction osteosynthesis. And this is after six weeks. Another example with fracture of the distal end of the radius, minimal shortening, massive volar displacement. So it is a compression pronation injury. Bone quality is rather good. And if we look at the CT scan, we can see that the comminution present both on the volar and the dorsal side. The DRUJ joint is affected, shortening and collapse. So we can go from the volar side, reaching the dorsal fragments and augment the plate buttressing blade fixation with cushion wires. This is another case with comminuted fractures yeah, of the I'm distal. Good, I'm good. I'm good. I'm good. Uh, comminuted fracture of the distal end of the radius. Again, intra-articular involvement, but with minimal displacement. This patient was hepatic with high PT and ST with prothrombin activity only 70%. So we choose to go for percutaneous fixation using Kirchner wires and achieve good results and uh, restoration of the normal anatomy. This is another case with fracture of the distal end of the radius, volar displacement and volar subluxation of the whole corpus together with the volar rim fragment. And if we notice here, the fragment is rather small, short, and uh, if we remember this is the watershed line, we cannot put the end of the blade behind this line. So it is it would be very difficult to fix the volar rim fragment to reduce the volar subluxation of the carpal bones here. So we used to use Amy Moore technique of spring wire fixing the volar fragments with Kirchner wires that is bent underneath the buttressing plates. And again, we can achieve a staple uh, reduction with normal anatomy. This is another difficult case with um, 70 years old man with uh, dog bite with these severe soft tissue injuries. Sorry. And this is the X-ray. We can see the uh, comminution, shortening, unstable. Uh, maybe there was a bone loss. And of course, in these situations, we will not be allowed to use proper fixation 
So we choose to put two cushion wires to maintain a uh, longitudinally to maintain the alignment, two transverse cushion wires to maintain the lens, and the position is not bad. And after three weeks, the uh, wounds are okay. There was no signs of infection. And the construct is rather good. But after a while, there was loosening of the transverse wires, collapse of the distal fragment, subluxation of the distal end of the ulna, loosening, look at this hole. So we went for potrusing plate, bone grafting, and we found that this will not be enough. And therefore we augmented the fixation with uh, a dorsal distraction plate. But after another two months, the bone graft was resorbed with osteoporotic distal fragment. As we can see, not fully united. So we went again, re bone grafting, corrected the uh, distal uh, screws and thanks for the distraction plate that helped us not to lose the uh, concept. And thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, my dear professor, Professor Asam El Kari, for this very interesting talk about the choice of implants in distal radius fractures. Thank you so much, sir. May, may I ask again, my dear professors, uh, to answer the uh, questions of our dear attendees in the uh, question and answer box. Uh, our next speaker will be Professor Baha Karana, uh, professor of orthopedic surgery at Azhar University and uh, one of the uh, board of the uh, Egyptian Orthopedic Association. Professor Baha will speak about forearm instability, diagnosis, and management. Professor Baha. Thank you. Is okay now? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay. Th thank you for inviting me for this uh, elegant uh, uh, conferences. And uh, uh, I think uh, we have a lot of uh, national and international speakers. My, my talk today about for our instability. And uh, thank you for, uh, for this uh, very nice uh, trauma webinar about, about uh, trauma. Uh, this is my learning objective about the uh, definition, injury pattern, anatomy, some structures, involvement, diagnosis, and treatment option. So what is the definition? The definition of the forearm instability is a complex problem resulting from trauma, disruption of the forearm stabilizer. So what are the stabilizers of the forearm? It's the radial head, the interosseous membrane, and triangle fibrocartilage complex. So looking for the anatomy and the biomechanical of the forearm stabilizer, we have structures in the proximal uh, radio anal joint with the articulation surface of the radial notch, annual ligament, and the head of the radius and the capillum of the humerus. So the radial notch of the ulna, it is located in the lateral aspect of the proximal ulna. Annual ligament is a circular in shape as a ring. And the proximal radio ulnar articulation uh, composed of bone and soft tissues is the head of the radius with the radial notch. The distal radio ulnar articulation is the bone, the head of the ulna, and the ulnar notch of the radius with soft tissue triangle fibrocartilage. So the ligament in the proximal part is the radio ulnar joint, it's annular ligament, the quadrant ligament, and the oblique uh, cord. In the distal one, the distal radio ulnar joint is composed of uh, the dorsal radio ulnar ligament, palmar radio ulnar ligament, the interosseous membrane. So the annular ligament is a strong band in the inner surface of the ligament covering the head of the radius. The quadrant ligament is attached, extending from the inferior edge of the radial notch, and its main function is help maintaining the radial head in the position to the radial notch. The oblique cord is a flat uh, facial band in the ventral of the forearm, and the main function significant is not clean. So the distal radio ulnar joint is articulated the ulnar notch of the radius with the articular disc and head of the ulnar. The ulnar notch of the radius is located in the distal end of the radius along the interosseous membrane. Articulated disc, it is very important. It is called the triangular fiber cartridge because it is a triangular in shape. 
it is uh, the main function to provide the stability to the inferior radio ulnar joint. So the ligament of the distal radio ulnar joint, it is we have a palmar and the dorsal radio ulnar ligament and the interosseous membrane. The main function uh, of the interosseous membrane is to maintain the space between the radius and the ulnar during the forearm rotation. Uh, the, the very important structure is the interosseous membrane is composed of five ligaments. The main one was the central band, is the key portion to the reconstruction uh, in the case of injury. Also, we have an accessory band, and also we have distal uh, oblique band, the proximal oblique cord, and dorsal oblique accessory cord. So muscles which are acting on uh, the forearm, uh, pronation by the pronator tears, pronator quadrators, and uh, the subination by sub and mainly by biceps and the subinator. And this is the muscle of the forearm. But what are the forearm units? The forearm unit is a single function unit com compromised or composed of radial and ulna, and their bone and soft tissue interacting, namely the proximal radio ulnar joint, the DRUG, and the interosseous membrane. And this is uh, what we call the forearm unit, it's bone and soft tissues. The function of the forearm unit is to maintain the structural stability of the radius relative to the ulna and preventing divergence transfer the load from the distal radius at the wrist joint to the proximal ulna as the elbow joint, provided attachment to the muscle traversing the hand, wrist, and the elbow. This is a forearm unit, which is composed of bone and soft tissues. The radial head is the primary contributing to the longitudinal forearm stability. The second stabilizer are the triangle fiber cartridge, TFCC, and the interosseous membrane. The three mechanisms uh, for this normal forearm function, the primary axial stabilizer is the radial head. The second stabilizer are the interosseous membrane and the ligament around the DRUG and the PRUG. The third principle is that the interosseous membrane is solely responsible for transfers a load between the wrist and the elbow. So the forearm instability, the forearm is an ring concept. You have to know this is a, a ring. And the key, uh, the key road, uh, role for this is the head radius, interosseous membrane, and distally the distal fiber uh, TFC. So it can be injured by double or multiple injury to this ring structures. This is the, the, the weight, uh, if uh, um, the transmission of the weight during compression and during distraction uh, through the forearm uh, to the elbow or from the forearm to uh, the, uh, the rest. So the rule of interosseous membrane, this is paper uh, being published, is the load transfer, transverse and preventing radius and ulnar bone. And the forearm interosseous membrane contributes to 70% of the forearm stability. We, uh, and we know from the anatomy scan, the main one is the central band, it can be injured and associated with the elbow fracture. So this is what we call the hidden injury. The interosseous membrane injury is called hidden injury. So we have two types of longitudinal uh, long for arm stability, either acute or chronic. The mechanism of injury is, uh, of the longitudinal for arm stability is that from trauma, falling and out stretching hand, distributing the, uh, and leading an impact on the axial force. This can be leading to several types of fracture, like is extravestor injury, Galeazzi fracture, and the Montega fracture dislocation. This is the mechanism of injury and how the force of transmitting and uh, injury to the head of the radius. And uh, this is how the injury, it can be by distraction force, attraction force about the collateral ligament by injury of the collateral ligament or avulsion, then impaction of the head of the radius of the elbow with movement of the electron on the electron fossa. <clears throat> in isexorbestal injury, and as, as we know, there is disruption of the interosseous membrane. In the galeazzi, there is a bone with the inferior radio ulnar joint injuries. And this is a distal radius fracture with distal radio ulnar joint disruption. We have two types, voral galeazzi fraction and dorsal galeazzi fraction. And in the Montega fractures, the, the injury to the uh, ulna with, with the radio ulnar joint, uh, with the radial head disruption. And we have uh, body classification into four types. 
So the pathomechanical instability is traumatic exodus through the forearm. This is related to radial head fraction, and this may be uh, or may not be associated with disruption of TFC and interosseous membrane. This is the injury from the normal, the force transmitted when the interosseous ligament complex and the DRU, DRUJ are disrupted, there is no transferring of the load between the radius and the ulna. And when the radio capitular relationship is lost, uh, the radial head resection or, or fracture of the neck of the radial head, the ulna transmitted the entire load to the elbow. And when the injury of the interosseous membrane or and the TRUG, the radius is longitudinal, unstable, and dissociation from the ulna allowing the radial to migrate proximal. So you have, for diagnosis, you have to make a suspicious for that. So it is a high index of suspicious for this injury if you have a patient with the forearm injury. The diagnosis of acute, you have a high index of suspicious, history of, uh, of axial load injury, examination of the whole upper limb is essential, concomitant bruising, swelling, tenderness uh, in the elbow or the forearm or the wrist may be present. Although there is often mild wrist tenderness with the radial head fractures. This is an example uh, for, for, to, for, for diagnosis of acute longitudinal forearm fractures. Also, we have a test is uh, clinical imaging of the sea finger compression test. This compression test elicits the brain with indicated disruption of interosseous membrane. And this is a test for compression of the inferior radio and large joint. And this is in supination and deformation and abnormal movement with tenderness in the inferior radio and large joint. And you have to examine for neurological test for, uh, for the elbow dislocation for the ulnar radius, median nerve, and median nerve, lower anterior interosseous brain. So uh, in the imaging, we have two types of imaging. We have a static, um, uh, static X-ray. Uh, uh, this is the X-ray, the radial head fracture commuted uh, or with evidence of impaction. Lateral elbow X-ray, a loss of the empty space, assesses the wrist radiography for evidence of positive ulnar variance. Comparative uh, uh, um, uh, contralateral risk X-ray should be obtained. This is an example of empty space sign and the multifragmented radial head fracture. You have to suspect that there is a forearm instability. And this is a fracture of the head wrist, impaction injuries. And we have a dynamic X-ray. This is a two test. Can you make an, a pronated grip view, pronator grip view? A difference in the positive ulnar variance may be observed. And we have an axial compression test and we have normal quotidian motion to be five millimeter or more changing of the ulnar variance. This is the ulnar variance. And this is the axial compression test, a distraction and A and compression difference uh, in this indicated the positive uh, interosseous membrane agents. After sonography can uh, identify uh, the central band injuries and the magnetic resistance and high si uh, signal and edema within the interosseous membrane. Uh, for the intraoperative, we have a, a pull test that is performed after removal of the head radius fragment just to pull the, the bone. If there is an abnormal movement, indicated that there is instability. Or radial joystick test, the laboratory is a forearm using bone holding, clamp holding the proximal end, where is the lateral direction force the spraying of the radius and the unknown. And this is an example of the intraoperative test. Diagnosis also history very, uh, of the elbow and the wrist injury, grip strength, history of previous axial injury, and then maybe remnant of the ulna and the positive grip test and the grind, uh, grinding test. This is an example uh, of how to diagnose them to the chronic to the stability. Diagnosis is uh, you have to put a high index of suspicious and uh, from the history, some sign of early failure, early loosening of the radial head, uh, uh, capitular erosion or with the proximal migration of the radial head, give you a suspicious of chronic to do the instability. Radiography will be used, uh, usually demonstrated positive ulnar variance and change in the radio capital, capitular head, a male union, and the previous surgically in, with the radial head. The aim of the treatment is uh, to 
to uh, re-stabilization of this for arm instability. So address is a specific component, either bony or ligament. For the bony, radial head, either repair or replace, and lig ligament to either repair or reconstruct. The most uh, uh, treatment strategy must be, uh, must be employed at the elbow for arm rest and whether there is an acute or chronic setting. In the elbow, the radial head, uh, in acute injuries, the radial head fracture may be the only apparent component in the external vessel, either you repair or replace, repair more challenge, uh, the range of the radial head arthroplast implant, metallic and uh, pyrocarbon, pairing surface options. And pyrocarbon, uh, better than silastic implant because the silastic leading to destructive synovitis. Radial head replacement, important consideration when you do this, you have got the correct diameter of the radial head, the height of the implant lens, because this will lead to a rapid capitular erosion, uh, medial offset, and also don't forget about cervical phallic angulation. For the rest, treatment of TFC pathology by repair of the TFC should be considered, and alternative crossing the bin radius and arm. And shortening or starting for the unknown uh, capitular uh, band. Interosseous ligament, there is a reconstruction and have many operations has been uh, uh, has been published. The interosseous ligament can be reconstructed either by Achilles tendon, flexor carbi radialis, palmaris longus, bone patellar tendon, or synthetic. This advantage insufficient inside the strength. This is an example uh, has been published about reconstruction of the interosseous ligament disruption. This is with using tight rope uh, reconstruction, and this is a tight rope, and can be used also bone ligament, bone graft for reconstruction of the interosseous membrane. And this is an, uh, another example of reconstruction of the interosseous membrane. And this is the ligament augmentation uh, and the reconstruction system. You have a salvage procedure. When you have a, a patient with a chronic, you can do a salvage procedure here, not responsible for the treatment, for the treatment of the pain and dysfunction. Use the Kabanji procedure and creation a one bone or either or creation a one bone for arm radio anastomosis. This advantage don't restore the, a good level of function uh, and the pain relief. This is a salvage procedure, like a Kabanji procedure. You excise the distal part of the bone and the fusion between the distal end of the anna and the radius with, uh, uh, with fusion. This is an example. Uh, take home message to think uh, about the stability of the forearm is gained by osseous and soft tissues, rare lesion after high index of axial load needed to address soft tissue injury prognosis is generally poor. And this is my reference and thank you for inviting me. Thank you so much, Professor Bakarana, for uh, this very interesting talk. Shukran gazilan ala hadritak hana afin in nahna yani. الوقت كان طايد بالنسبه لحضرتك عشان تجوين اس ثانك يو سو ماتش بروفيسور بهاء ثانك يو شكرا جزيلا يا فندم اور نيكست سبيكر ويل بي بروفيسور محمد مصطفى قطب بروفيسور اوف اورثوبيدك سيرجري اسيوت يونيفرستي بروفيسور محمد از ماي دير برادر اند ماي دير فريند اند وي ويل سبيك اباوت بوست تروماتيك ريست ارثرايتس سيمبل بروسيدير اكسلنت ريزالتس بروفيسور محمد ثانك يو فور جويننج اس سير Thank you very much, Professor Al-Ashab, for inviting me uh, in among uh, these uh, eminent names, international and national speakers. Actually, they are my uh, professors and uh, colleagues. Uh, I would like to highlight uh, a simple procedure that uh, have been proven uh, to uh, serve our patients who have got complex wrist injuries and uh, there was only one uh, uh, option is to arthrodes or to fuse these joints, which is uh, very uh, cumbersome for a lot of patients, uh, especially hard labrador. Uh, I'm uh, Asiut University Hospital, uh, and my talk will be about proximal row carpectomy. Uh, simply is this excision of the proximal uh, carpal row, meaning scaphoid, lunate, and traquitrium, and sometimes you remove the uh, uh, part of the scaphoid uh, of the radial styloid uh, to improve the range of motion and uh, re relieve the pain uh, from the radial side of the wrist joint. 
So as we know that motion is life and life is motion, and we have teached uh, a lot of our students uh, these words. So the first prescription to keep this motion and to, to keep the uh, mobility of the wrist joint was prescribed in 1944. Uh, and it was used to the ununited fracture of scaphoid and some types of uh, Kimbok disease. And until very recently, there is a lot of publications about the same procedure and uh, using it in different, uh, another different indications like a scaphoid dissociation. And this is a, a report in two, uh, 2011. So what about the uh, indications? It is the arthritic wrist, whether, whatever it is degenerative or traumatic. And the contraindication have been uh, 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 put like arthritic lunate fossa or capitate proximal pole because they are the uh, two articular surfaces which will uh, be the main dominant for the mobility of the wrist after excision of the proximal pole. However, I think it is a reproducible uh, 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 form of the procedure and we will see how we can uh, increase our indications for using the procedure for uh, these two contraindications. So uh, the, the main uh, stay about this procedure is to uh, provide a painless adequate motion grip strength uh, of the wrist joint. And uh, we insist on doing a preoperative evaluation to see the arthritis of the capitate and the lunate fossa because as we said, these are the contraindication to do uh, this procedures as presumed previously. Uh, so this is the surgical approach. Uh, for the open proximal rocker pectomy, it is a dorsal approach. And uh, either you use this uh, tongue flap, distally based uh, capsular uh, flap, if you want to uh, cover the uh, arthritic part of the uh, capitate or the lunate fossa and the radius, or you can use this limb uh, ligament preserving uh, approach, which uh, is like a, a rectangular uh, a type of flab of the capsule, uh, radially based, and you can do the proximal rocker pectomy through this window, and then you close it back so you have preserved the whole dorsal ligaments of the wrist joints. And this is a small video showing the uh, how you can do the procedure, and this is the dorsal approach, and identifying the extensor pulse longus and the floor of the fourth compartment, where is the posterior interosseous nerve, and we do uh, uh, rest denervation through neurectomy of the posterior interosseous nerve and also we open the interosseous membrane and do uh, denervation of the anterior interosseous nerve also. And uh, the next question is, you, uh, do you prefer to do it as a one piece or a piece meal? Most of authors uh, uh, prescribe the removal of the uh, carpal row in a piece meal manner. However, I find that in my hands, it's difficult to, to remove all the fragments and might uh, uh, keep some fragments or leave some fragments, especially a bowler. So I prefer to you to make it uh, like a one piece. Uh, however, it takes uh, some time, but uh, with practice, you will find it very easily and you can excise the whole uh, carpal row in a one piece like this and you can identify the pathology. For example, this is a advanced Kimbok disease and you can see the coronal fracture in the lunate, and these are the ligaments, uh, examining the intercarpal ligaments, and you can take it like one piece, like you can see from uh, the video. The most important crucial point of view uh, is uh, to keep the volar uh, radio luno traquitrial ligament. This is a very important ligament to keep in the volar part, because if you cut it or uh, it is injured, you will find an ulnar translation of the wrist joint post-operatively. So it is a crucial uh, point uh, during uh, your surgery to keep this ligament intact polarly. What about arthroscopic proximal row carpectomy? Actually, it is mentioned in the literature and I've tried once, but you will lose a lot of uh, shavers uh, and it will take some time uh, more than the open uh, part, and they did not find any uh, advantage except it, uh, it is uh, putting some uh, uh, hard time to the surgeon rather than uh, making a benefit for the patient. 
What about the contraindication? As we have said, this is the most important slide because it has been postulated that it is contraindicated this procedure in arthritic lunate fossa or arthritic capitate proximal pole. So uh, we we have uh, uh, seen that there are a plan to uh, in, to extend your indication into those two uh, uh, contraindications. Plan A is to cover to cover this arthritic part, and it is uh, prescribed by Green that you can make a tongue flap of the uh, dorsal capsule, like we have seen in the previous slide, and you can suture it back to the anterior capsule. So you cover this part of the capitate or uh, delunate if it is uh, arthritic. So this is called interposition uh, capsular flap. So you can use it uh, if you have arthritic proximal pull or uh, arthritic, sorry, the capitate fossa or the lunate fossa in the radial scaphoid. And this is a one example intraoperative uh, photo showing how it is arthritic, the distal radius, but the capitate is okay. So you can use this as the capsular flap uh, distally based and it is sutured back to the uh, volar aspect of the capsule. So it is like interposition between the two articular surfaces uh, if it is uh, arthritic. And this is the uh, range of motion. And this is the post operative x ray. You will see a distraction between the distal carpal row and the radius because of the interposed uh, capsule in between. The plan B to extend your indication of this procedure. Also, you can uh, use what is called mosaicoplasty, which is, have been postulated to be used in the knee joint and other joints in the body. Also, you can use the same procedure for the uh, carpal row. Uh, this is an example of a uh, huge ulcer and uh, underlying cyst in the capitate. And uh, because we did a proximal row carpectomy, there is, you have a lot of, of bone, intact bone with articular cartilage. Uh, if the, the scaphoid did the uh, original pathology, so you can take from the lunate. If the lunate, you can take from the scaphoid. So you have a plenty of osteoarticular uh, normal cartilage. You can excise and you can tailor it like the, uh, as the defect exactly. And you can close your defect like this one. Uh, and uh, this is uh, extended your indication of the proximal carpal low carpectomy to uh, arthritic uh, joints. What about rest innervation? I think it is a crucial part of, uh, of our technique. And uh, it has been postulated that you do posterior and anterior interosseous nerve neurectomy through the dorsal approach where you do the open uh, proximal row carpet. What about the post-operative protocol? It has been uh, post, uh, uh, in the literature it has been stated that you uh, take continuous palmar splint for two weeks, intermittent splint for another four weeks, and physiotherapy started after four weeks. But actually, uh, personal experience in my hand, I allowed the patient immediate active uh, daily living as tolerated, as been tolerated. And I have seen some patients restored their complete function, for example, a butcher, before removing the suture. I mean, before uh, two weeks post operatively. And these are some case presentations to show the uh, results of our procedure. This is one example of a male, 47 years old. He has got a scaphoid non-union advanced collapse with arthritic uh, uh, radial uh, side of the uh, uh, scaphoid fossa. And this is the MRI and CT. And to see the magnitude of arthritis. And this is after excision. And uh, as we have seen, this is a cyst in the capitate, and we put the mosaicoplasty from the removed bone. Another case also, we, we fix this uh, osteoarticular uh, cartilage, and this is the range of motion. Of course, it is less than normal. However, it kept uh, motion, and it gives much better results than uh, rest fusion. And this is the follow-up uh, x-rays and hand so in conclusion, it is a reproducible, uh, simple procedure as we, if you got uh, arthritis, which was considered as a contraindication. Now you can extend your procedure to this contraindication by these two plans, either interposition arthroplasty by the capsule or by the mosaicoplast. It improves both pain and range of motion and uh, uh, other options are still available if the uh, usual contraindication have been found in such cases and also you can 
uh, use your uh, rest innervation to magnify your procedure in pain killing uh, for uh, your patient. Thank you very much, Professor Ashab. Thank you for the attendees. I hope it was a small message for you. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Professor Mohammed Mustafa Khud, for this very interesting presentation and very interesting talk. Uh, thank you so much, sir. Uh, again, may I ask uh, my dear speakers and my dear professors to answer the questions, to write the answer of the questions in the question and answer box to our dear attendees, because we have to stick to the time. Our next speaker will be my dear uh, professor, Professor Amr Azam, professor of orthopedic surgery, uh, Neuromotor uh, National Institute. Professor uh, Azam will speak about a very interesting topic, articular distal radial fracture in adults. Professor Am, thank you so much, sir. Uh, thank you, Professor Mohammed, for your kind invitation. Honor to be with you and my dear colleagues and uh, professors. Um, uh, our message today is to speak about a single case of the articular distal radial fractures in adults. And of course, Professor Asam al karif and Professor Baha Korna uh, have made my job easy. I am working in the National Institute of Neuromotor System here in Cairo. Here we have a case of 39 years old female with a foul and outstretched hand with left non-dominant hand with no other injuries regarding the elbow and the carpals. Our learning objectives, we are going to speak about the different or describing the different types of distal radial fractures with listing the indications for operative and non-operative treatment, which is a very important to be highlighted. Also to outline the surgical approach for the fixation of the radial fractures and the choosing the appropriate implants uh, according to the fracture type. Okay, this is a distal radial fractures uh, to be uh, epidemiologically the most common in all ages might be a variant from a minimally displaced fracture with a low energy with a poor bone stock and elderly populations and another variant with a high energy uh, trauma occurs most probably in the young populations with a shortening of the collapse might be accompanied by carpal instability. To know our uh, to know our way in the lower radius, we have to know the anatomy properly regarding the dorsal cortex, which is thinner and weaker, with the volar cortex, with the origin of the radiocarpal ligaments, which has to be preserved all through your uh, intervention. Scaphoid fossa in the uh, lower articular surface radius and the lunate fossa, and the most important is the sigmoid notch, taking a special consideration why it is fractured. What about the normal variants here? Polar tilt of the lower radius with 11 degrees, as we all know, with a uh, radial height about 11 to 12 millimeters, and to know the radial inclination 22 to 23 degrees. This is the most important variance that we may build up our necessity for surgery uh, for such a cases. Also, the lastly, the ulnar. Uh, uh, which was going to be a zero degree. Um, here we have the classification starts, uh, I think, uh, long years ago, but the columnar series start by Rigazzoni 1995 and also republished in 2019 by Blazer. What, how can we do a surgery or what is the necessity for the operation? To know the necessity for the operation, we have to know when not to operate. When not to operate, in the lower radius means non-displaced fractures and a very low demand patients and the geriatric patients with unfit to surgery. And also, this is uh, absolute indications for these uh, lower radial fracture fixations in the open fractures and the articular fractures and the acute carpal tunnel syndrome. What about the relative indications? What will be the failure of close reduction and failure of adequately to reduce the fracture and difficult to treat a patient with a cost. Um, uh, the treatment options that Professor Assam mentioned, this might be a closed reduction or a, in a cast, or be aware about the compartment syndrome, keep an eye on your patient, and a closed reduction with a percutaneous spinning or a closed reduction with application of an external fixator, an open reduction application of a plating aided by its uh, wires, or a combination of all of these. What about the American Academy of Orthopedic Association 2017? It stated that there is no method of fixation um, 
to be recommended over the other, and there is no level one clinical evidence suggesting a superior modality for treatment of resistor radius fracture. So it is a la carte. Uh, back again to our case, to remember such a case. Can we classify such a case uh, as a fracture? No, we have to use another modality. So we have to know the classification, the most popular nowadays, which was published 2018 in the AO, uh, OTA, uh, the types uh, regard, classified into type A and B and C. Uh, to classify such a fracture regarding the all the fra articular fractures, we have to do the uh, CT with a multi-slice. Uh, so to, denoting that we are facing the articular multifragmentary fracture with a simple metaphyseal and the step, small uh, extra-articular tip of the stylized process fracture of the ulna. What's our, what about our aim? The aim for the anatomical reduction, as we all know, this uh, with no steps, no gaps, with a rigid fixation, and as we all know, the principles, the early mobilization. What about the planning has to be done? The planning starts from the preoperative uh, period, the patient examination, if there is any wounds or edema, uh, consultation with our colleagues to prepare the idea and the aim and the plan, and also the patient counseling and consent. Full instrument set uh, preparation for this uh, such a case will be a locking compression plate and K-wires and many uh, Hoffman fixator. And to review the literature speaking about the internal fixation versus external fixation, 12, uh, 2015 and 2017 as well. Why are we going to use an LCP plate? LCP plate, as Professor Assam mentioned, we have a different modalities of LCP plates, but the highlighting the uh, an internal fixator principle, not to jeopardizing the periosteum, it must not, wouldn't be uh, uh, scrapping the periosteum, and this is a, we have a great advantage with a low offset plate, and the locking head screws is an angled plate plate all of them at the articular surface when it's fixed to the plate act each of them at an angle plate plate with a great stability advantage from uh, the versus the conventional screws. What about the steps? You have to prepare your plan from A to Z regarding the contralateral side testing and the external fixator as a temporary fixation in intraoperative with a close reduction and traction under image with a percutaneous wire to fix the posterior fragment as the LCP does wouldn't reduce the fragment. You have to, you to use to reduce the fragment before application or fixing the fracture by LCP. Applying the LCP uh, plate with a final radiology check as we are going to mention and the removal of fixator with a DRUG as professor uh, Basha uh, spoke about the RG assessment before you go away and closure in layer and back slab. So the contralateral rest has to be examined for the regarding the radiological um, parameters and the range of motion. To know your fixator, you have to know the fixator has a proper has a proper uh, safe corridor regarding the second metacarpal shaft and the uh, med shaft or diaphyseal part of the radius fixation uh, corridor. Here we have the plate fixation using the volar approach, the Henry approach, and then applying the uh, K-wires temporary fixation the, of the fragments and then application of the LCP plate properly. The final radiological check after fixing by screw LCP screws proximal and distal, you have to use two modalities or two views. The dorsal tangential view, here we have the uh, the, uh, you, the arm of the patient tilted uh, about 15 degrees from the vertical and the lower uh, the rest is flexed. Bolarly to uh, have the highlight about the image showing here the proper length of the screws, not piercing the dorsal cortex, not jeopardizing the uh, the extensor tendons, which is a very important complication you have to avoid. And another view is uh, the lateral view, but we have to elevate the forearm in a 60 degrees to have the dead lateral view, abolishing the effect or the double effect of the radial styloid to know the your screws are intra-articular or extra-articular. You had to use these two views. 
What about the DRUJ? It is a repetition of Professor Baha has mentioned. It is an ulnar compression against the radius, while the forearm is passively uh, foot in the flex, so full supination and pronation. When you wouldn't hear the palpable click, it is, means that it's a stable DRUJ, which is mentioned in the AO surgery reference. What about our case? Here we have the post-operative X-ray, immediate post-operative X-ray, and another one, six weeks post-operatively, showing the uh, healing process is ongoing. And the physiotherapy starts for 12 weeks, here we have the, our clever uh, patient with a full range of motion regarding flexion, extension, ulnar deviation, radial deviation, the which was regained. What about our take-home message? We have to think about the surgical indications. Thinking about this intra, when it's an intra-articular step off two millimeters or more, or radi radial shortening um, more than three millimeters, and the dorsal tilt with, with, with me at a minus degree, which is a normal, is a volar tilt by 10 to 11 degrees with a radial inclination less than 15 degrees, which is normally 22 degrees. If you select, please, the open reduction terminal fixation, be aware about the dorsal tendons and the anterior radiocarpal ligaments as well. And please don't forget to check the DRUJ, otherwise you are going to fix the, the ulnar styloid. Lastly, it's important to understand the anatomy of the lower radius. Go to more information, having attraction view intraoperatively or the CT scan. The CT scan is much better nowadays and multiple treatment options considering the patient needs and your skills as well. And lastly, remi reminding you there is no level one evidence to support the treatment modalities. And lastly, please have a good soft tissue handling. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Professor Amra Azem, for this very interesting talk. Uh, thank you so much, sir. Thank you. Uh, now we will move to our next speaker. Our next speaker is my dear friend and my dear brother, Professor uh, Faisal Zaid, Al Azhar University. Professor Faisal will speak about the posterior shoulder dislocation. Professor Faisal. Uh, Assalamu alaikum. Alaikum uh, uh, First of all, I'd like to express my deepest gratitude and thanks to Professor Mohammed Al Ashab for inviting me and giving me the opportunity to be to share in uh, this uh, mega event, International Trauma uh, Webinar. Uh, my talk today is, a, is about uh, shoulder trauma uh, case discussion. I'll, uh, uh, I'll share with you some cases of posterior shoulder uh, dislocation. Just a minute, please. Okay. Uh, first case is a male patient, 25 years old, exposed to uh, trauma six weeks ago, uh, and unfortunately managed conservatively by three different orthopedic uh, surgeons. By examination of the, uh, we can see the uh, locked uh, shoulder, and this is the X-ray of the of our patient. Uh, by reviewing the normal uh, anteroposterior view, routine anteroposterior view of the shoulder, we can uh, see clearly the uh, normal Shenton or Mullins line and the glenohumeral overlap with uh, preservation of the uh, neck shaft angle of the proximal humerus. In our case, there's disruption of the Mullins line, which is equal to the Shenton line with what's called the glenoid vacant sign with no overlap between the humeral head and the glenoid with a light bulb sign uh, due to a, a extreme internal rotation of the proximal uh, humerus. Uh, by doing a, a scapular lateral view, we can see clearly here is the, the humeral head is outside the glenoid and the CT is uh, of great value. It's very beneficial in the diagnosis of uh, cases of posterior shoulder dislocation, especially in cases of locked posterior shoulder uh, dislocation, as we see here. This is the 3D CT of the patient. As regarding options for the treatment, uh, maybe non-operative, acute reduction and immobilization external rotation for uh, six weeks. I think this is not the uh, option for uh, this case. And uh, we all agree the patient need an operative uh, intervention. What about the operative options for this patient? 
uh, open or arthroscopic posterior liberal uh, repair after uh, uh, open or closed reduction, open or arthroscopic posterior capsular shift and rotator interval closure, humeral head derotation osteotomy, allograft, osteochondral allograft, open reduction with subscapularis transfer, which is called the McLaughlin or least tuberous transfer to the defective modified McLaughlin, hemiarthroplasty, uh, and lastly, total arthroplasty. Uh, the decision depends on the duration of dislocation, age of the patient, activity level of the patient, and lastly, the defect size. There is there are a lot of algorithms suggested for lock the posterior shoulder dislocation as this one by Kukalis in 2017, depending on the uh, the either the, the patient is presented acutely or chronic after three weeks, and according to the size of the defect, uh, if it is uh, less than 25% of the humeral head or larger than 25 and less than 50% of the humeral head, and if the, the defect size is more than 50% of the uh, articular uh, surface. So this is, a, a, this is a suggested algorithm for the treatment of cases of locked posterior shoulder dislocation. An elder patient with low debound, we can proceed for conservative treatment. If the defect is between 20 and 30% and the, the uh, shoulder is stable after uh, open or closed reduction, we can proceed for conservative uh, treatment. And if the, the, the shoulder is unstable, we can proceed for McLaughlin or modified McLaughlin procedure. If the defect of the humeral head is between 30 and 40%, we can proceed for allograft or secondary allograft with or without arthroscopic banker repair. And if the defect Effect is more than 50%, we can proceed for arthroplasty. Uh, how can we measure the uh, reversed heel sacs defect by uh, drawing a circle over the humeral head and drawing a line uh, uh, over the, from the center of this circle to the anterior and posterior mm -hmm. ends of the defect? And uh, uh, there are a lot of papers published uh, to treat the reverse heel sacs lesion as this one uh, in treating midterm outcome following a fresh frozen humeral head osteochondral allograft reconstruction for reverse heel sacs lesion, more than 30% with good results by reshaping of the uh, reversed heel sacs into elliptical form and taking an osteochondral graft and fixing it with uh, two headless uh, screws. And this is a post-operative uh, X-ray of this uh, patient. Uh, by going back to our case, this is the uh, locked posterior shoulder dislocation. By measuring the humeral uh, defect of the humeral head, uh, reverse head sex lesion, we found it is 25% uh, of the humeral head. So we choose to do an open reduction with subscapularis transfer, as the, mentioned by McLaughlin in 1952. Uh, and sometimes we need to uh, do a transfer of the lesser tuberosity, which is modified McLaughlin by uh, Hugs and Neer in uh, 1975. Uh, this our patient under anesthesia. We can so we can see uh, obviously the locked shoulder with no abduction or external rotation. So uh, we try uh, uh, try just the trial of closed reduction but it's failed, so uh, we proceed for uh, open reduction through deltobectoral approach and delivering the humeral head into the glenoid, and we can see clearly the uh, reversed heel sacs depict in the front of the humeral head. Then we uh, insert two suture anchors into the defect with subscapularis tendon transferred into the defect and fixed with sutures. This is the post-operative X-ray of the, our patient, uh, immobilization of the shoulder with an external rotation brace for six weeks, followed by progressive passive active assisted and active range of motion and rotator cuff strengthening exercise for another six weeks. This technique results in uh, free range of motion, stable shoulder with good joint congruency. 
Uh, second case is this uh, patient 30 years old exposed to a uh, road traffic accident and they come to us after two months and treated by the same way that the effect size was 30% of the humeral head. And this is the post-operative X-ray of the patient. And this is the range of motion of our patient with a completely full range of shoulder motion. So we can, can't differentiate between the affected and non-affected shoulder. The last case was a male patient, 65 years old, presented after falling down after sudden convulsion attack. Uh, we can see the uh, glenoid vacant sign and the light bulb sign in spite of preserved chin tone line. And this is the 3D CT of the patient. And this is the CT. Uh, the the uh, patient undergone a trial of, uh, of reduction, uh, which was failed and come to me after two trials of closed reduction. Uh, under general anesthesia, we uh, do another trial of closed reduction. The most important thing is to apply a lateral traction force over the proximal humerus to disimpact the posteriorly displaced humeral head with the longitudinal traction in the internal rotation uh, to avoid fracture of the proximal uh, humerus. This is a CT post reduction and we choose to treat this patient uh, uh, as he is a low demanding patient 65 years old conservatively and the patient uh, do uh, well uh, to conclude and take home message acute posterior shoulder dislocation are less common than anterior dislocation but more commonly missed uh, 50 to 79 percent of traumatic posterior shoulder dislocation seen in the emergency department are undiagnosed abduction, flexion, internal rotation at time of injury. Look for light bulb sign and the vacant glenoid sign and disrupt the chintal lines sometimes. Reduce with, uh, with traction and gentle anterior translation and avoid external rotation, which can lead to fracture. As regarding decision-making, you must keep in mind the duration of dislocation age of the patient, activity level, and the defect size. Open reduction with subscapularis transfer or lesser tuberous transfer to the defect are good options for defects between 20 and 30%. Uh, Thank you again. Thank you so much, Professor uh, Faisal Zaid, for this very interesting talk. Uh, again, may I ask uh, my dear speakers to answer the question of my dear attendees in the question and answer box. Uh, now we will move to the uh, last speaker in the upper limb session. Uh, my dear friend, uh, Professor Ashraf Abdelaziz, Professor of Orthopedic Surgery at Azhar University. Professor Ashraf will speak about post-traumatic uh, radial club hand deformity. Professor Ashraf. Uh, thank you, Professor uh, Mohammed Al Ashraf for this invitation. Uh... I think uh, there are problem in uh, sharing my uh, presentation. In uh, uh, so I will start uh, with another device. Yeah, give me uh, one one uh, minute. Okay, sir. Okay. Okay, sir. It's okay. Y yes, sir. Please. Yes, sir. Okay, sir. Can you maximize the photo bit? No, no. No. Yeah, yeah. Keda, stop it, man. Are you okay, on? sir? Yes, sir. Is it gone? Hold on, I'm going maximization, Dr. Ashraf, and I'll show you the picture. I'm going to show you the picture. Are you hearing me? Are you hearing me? Yes, sir. 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 Yes,
ثانيه هو بس حضرتك ماكسمايز الكيس برزنتيشن ماكسمايز الكيس برزنتيشن اللي هي 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 مش باينه قوي فاهم يس سر بالظبط حضرتك ممكن نريموف الصورتي بقى خالص يا فندم بعد اذن حضرتك تمام اوكي ثانك يو سر Now we'll talk about uh, acquired radial club hand a case report. Introduction treatment of acquired radial club hand is difficult. The option and the guidelines for treatment of uh, congenital of the congenital uh, variety may not be applicable for treatment of acquired type. The goals are uh, cosmetic improvement, maintenance of any uh, wrist motion. And stable painless uh, wrist and forearm motion. Surgical uh, option interposition bone grafting, centralization, radio ulnar transposition. Uh, recently, the circular external fixator can be used for uh, bone transport. Our patient, uh, she is a female, five years old, with history of chronic osteomyelitis of distal radius, managed by uh, debridement several times, uh, about five times. Uh, signs of vision deformity, instability, limitation of left uh, wrist, and the cosmetic affection. Uh, this is a picture of the patient, and this is a photo. There are complete instability of the wrist uh, joint and the cosmetic affection. This has scars of uh, previous uh, multiple operation. This uh, pre-operative X-ray, there are complete instability of the wrist joint, complete absorption of the radius. What to do? The goal cosmetic improvement, maintenance of inner wrist uh, uh, mobility, stable bellus wrist and forearm motion. Our surgical uh, options, interposition bone grafting, Centralization, in this case, uh, not available for uh, radio ulnar uh, transposition or circular external fixator. Why I choose uh, centralization and manage this patient like uh, congenital radial club hand. Our surgical uh, technique, this is two flaps, uh, flap on the ulnar side and the central flap, and we will move the ulnar uh, flap to the central flap and central flap we will move to the radial side. Uh, the scar on the radial side, we will be uh, 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 managed by z -plasty. The surgical technique, we will be uh, 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 in this the next uh, uh, video. Uh, sorry, this is a flat. Uh, radial club hand كان حصل لها فراكشر ريديوس وبعد كده حصل فيها نيكروزس و this is a two flaps and we will move this flap move the ulnar side flap and central flap we will move to the radial side there are markers on the extensor tendon radial club hand congenital احنا عملنا الفلاب اهي ادي الفلاب بتاعتنا الفيونجا اهي كده flaps وبعدين هنلفها كده لما نيجي نلف يتفتح السكن الاول ده الاكستنسور ده ده اكستنسور تندون تمام دي ذير ار لوس اوف ذا اكستنسور بولشز لونجس هنا الاكستنسور بولشز لونجس موجوده بس يعني 
كراجد في ادهيجن جامده جدا زراع كراجد اكسنس اوف بورش لونجس اند لوس اوف اتاتشمنت ذيس اكسنس اوف كارب انارس الحاجات اللي على الانر سايد ما فيهاش مشكله اند ذيس اكسبوز ذا ديستال انر فتحنا الكبسول وادي الديستال انر اند وي ستارت شيفنج اوف ذا ديستال انر بعد كده بارتيكولار سيرفيس الناحيه دي على الريديان ساين عملنا هنا زي بلاستي زي بلاستي اند اكسبوجر اوف ذا ريديان ارتري وبعد كده عملنا لينسنج اوف ذا فليكسور كارب راديانس بالمارس لونجس اللي هي الحاجات اللي على الريديان ساين اوكي بس الفاضل معانا اي ويل ريموف كده مصفى I will remove the neonate bone, then make centralization and impaction of the distal ulna inside the proximal carpal bone. After fixation of the anti-grade and retrograde wire, From the cells that meet the carpal to central to the medulla of the ulna of the ulna, and another wire from proximal to distal. This sensor the 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 sensor أنا هناخد هنا طبعا الاكسنسور كارباي راديالس لونجس او ذيس از ا بوست اوبريتيف اكس راي ذيس افتر 6 ويك فولو اب ذا ريزلت ات ذا لاست فولو اب ذا انجل اوف راديال ديفيشن واز 5 ديجري اند فولر فليكشن از 4 ديجري ذا لينس اوف ذا انا Uh, post operative remain equal to the opposite uh, limb, no uh, finger stiffness. This is after uh, two months follow up after removal of K wire. This is uh, the last uh, follow up of the patient. The patient uh, not start uh, the uh, uh, physiotherapy. Discussion uh, radial club hand uh, uh, deformity acquired after osteomyelitis is very rare, and surgical uh, correction remain a challenge for the orthopedic surgeon. Uh, in literature, various treatment modality uh, for uh, the acquired radial club hand, uh, like cancellous bone graft, vascularized or non-vascularized, combined with ulnar shortening, interposition bone grafting, centralization, Bone transport by Lizarov. This reference, thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Ashraf Abdelaziz, for this very interesting case discussion. Now we come to the end of the upper limb trauma session. May I ask my dear speakers to answer any questions in the question and answer box down there uh, from our dear attendees. Now we will move to the uh, next session. The next session will be the spine trauma session. And the first speaker will be Professor Abdel Fattah Saoud, Professor of Orthopedic Surgery uh, in Chams uh, University and the Vice President of Chams University for uh, Student Affairs. Uh, Professor Abdel Fattah, uh, Mr. Fattah, 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 Mr. Fattah,